Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and welcome to another intriguing episode featuring R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour. Now let me ask you a question. When is the right time to teach your kids about... Hang on, let me check my notes here. Alien cannibalism. You might be thinking I'm exaggerating because where does this fit in with the genre of young adult horror? I must be overselling it, right? No, I assure you, this episode gets gruesome. As a reminder, The Haunting Hour was intended for a slightly older age group, preteens and teens, than Stein's Goosebumps series, which was targeted more towards kids 7 and up. Typically, these shows use characters that are closer in age to their demographics, so in Goosebumps you'll see characters slightly older than 7 and up, and in The Haunting Hour you will see more teenagers, and the stories in the show are much more mature and gruesome, though in this particular episode, called Alien Candy, I struggled with the tone because the main characters were were young, and it kept waffling back and forth between really disturbing and really corny. I've covered children's horror that has walked that line, stories that have teetered into being too macabre, and there have been visuals in this series that have been much more unsettling, but this episode took the cake for me. Without hyperbole, I can honestly say that my jaw dropped at some of these scenes, and I was left with a very squeaked out feeling. So let's talk about it. Where does alien candy fall on the children's horror spectrum? <laughs> We start our tale at a middle school where an announcement is being made that the cafeteria will be serving their ever-popular chicken nuggets. Walt and his friend Tim are alien enthusiasts. They go to sci-fi conventions, they read conspiracy theories, and Walt even brings his book on aliens to lunchtime. He's so dedicated that he dyed his normally red hair brown so he could be Han Solo for Halloween. An icon must be respected. I know. Walt is extremely animated and talks like a 30-year-old YouTube critic. How's that book anyways? It's good. Except for the hokey cover and cliche looking alien. Okay, but I can clearly see you're only one page in. As they leave, school bully Dwayne makes fun of Walt's book. The quest for alien contact. Huh. What a totally normal and inconspicuous close-up of these teenagers reacting to the title of the book. I'm sure it means absolutely nothing and doesn't give anything away prematurely. A small kerfuffle takes place and Walt knocks over the lunch lady's food cart. Oh no, so many pre-cooked nugs wasted. My homemade nuggets. Wasted. Oh. The kids are sorry, but they're instructed to take out the trash to the dumpster after school all week. She's really intense about it. Lunch lady's got some moxie. After school all week. Oh no, seven days, what is this torture? As Walt is fumbling with the garbage bags, the totally normal and not suspicious eighth graders follow him. He's small, only a sixth grader. His intellect is what counts. See, completely standard teenager chit-chat, nothing weird here. They introduce themselves as Greg and Bonnie and invite Walt to a secret sci-fi club where they discuss all things extraterrestrial. They appeal to Walt's interest by saying that Bonnie's dad works on a secret project involving aliens and this convinces him to join. They show him their secret meetup spot and some kind of weird glowing stone. In order for Walt to meet and communicate with an alien, they tell him he needs to eat supplements that look like radioactive jelly beans. It's not really candy. It's a special supplement formulated by a government lab. Everything about this screams drugs, but okay, why not? Later that night, Tim pays a visit to Walt's house and asks him why he's acting so weird. Even though he's not supposed to tell anyone, Walt indulges him about the secret club that promises alien contact and Tim begs to join. Bonnie and Greg are pissed and say Tim is not suitable for the club, period. I'll tell him you said no. Tim is mad, but Walt still wants to join the club, downing the glowing jelly beans and feeling more and more out of it as he does. Later that night, Bonnie and Greg break into Walt's house. They freeze him to his bed with the strange stone, take some vitals, which they got from his foot, and then Greg says, The candidate is suitable for digestion. Oh no. See, these were not jelly beans. Shocking, I know. They were supplements meant to neutralize any viruses, making him safe to eat. Though Walt is paralyzed in bed, he is still aware of what is about to happen, which is a terrifying thought. The pair transform into their alien selves, and though it's not explicitly shown, the episode really makes it clear that the alien is taking a bite from Walt's foot. It uses juicy sound effects, strange lighting, and shows the alien chewing and swallowing one of Walt's toes, and my jaw damn near unhinged itself. 
As gruesome and upsetting as this part is, it takes a very sudden turn into the comical. Bonnie notices that Walt is a redhead in one of his pictures, and they are allergic to redheads, no joke. <laughs> He's a ginger, we can't eat him, run! The tonal whiplash is severe. I went from a mild stomach ache to laughing hysterically at this arbitrary twist about genetic makeup. Walt wakes up believing it was just a bad nightmare. Greg wants to kill Walt, but Bonnie insists that it would attract too much attention and that no one will believe his story anyway. He discovers his missing toe while in the locker room, and Dwayne witnesses this. I like the placement of the anti-bullying sign in the next shot. But what if your bully is an alien who ate your toe? Bonnie takes a moment to threaten him, and also explains that their saliva has healing abilities, and that the toe will be fine. She exposes her teeth, and he makes a run for it. He's captured by Dwayne and shoved into a dumpster. Bonnie and Greg now set their sights on Tim, and they instruct him not to tell Walt, as it will be a surprise when he joins the club. Walt escapes and calls Tim, only to figure out he's been taken by the aliens. He books it to the secret room and they go on this wild chase that resembles the kitchen scene from Jurassic Park. I mean, it's really close, full of diversions, close calls, and beings with scary teeth. In a questionable move, they start throwing plastic Tupperware at the aliens? <laughs> Paper plastic assholes! Yeah, this doesn't work. Hmm, what can we do from here? Quick, grab the paprika! Walt blinds them with cooking spray and Tim douses them in salt, which has a melting slug effect. They promptly turned into goo. Good thing they didn't grab the paprika, I guess. This isn't even the weirdest part. Right after the aliens gooify, the lunch lady comes in, ready to start on her world-famous chicken nuggets, not even noticing the alien parts on the counter. They get pushed into the mixture, which she doesn't even check, and she begins her new batch. You can even see the green globs jiggling as she shovels chicken pieces into the bowl. Oh hey, looks like they're gonna be doused in paprika after all. I know none of this is real, and the visuals are meant for added gross-out factor, something horror for young adults does a lot, but it got to me. I have a pretty strong stomach, but when it comes to people or even humanoids being cooked into something, I get extremely squeamish. The next day, Dwayne the bully exclaims the nuggets taste more flavorful today. Walt finds a fingertip in his nugget, and the episode ends on a blood-curdling scream. <laughs> Okay, final thoughts. As I've already mentioned, I found this episode really jarring because it goes from being gruesome and intense to slightly comical, so both my brain and my stomach were doing flips trying to, ahem, digest this story. The teenagers playing the aliens were actually really good. Perfectly weird and off, even though you know pretty much in the first three minutes that they are the aliens. Finding out they were malevolent wasn't exactly a twist or surprise. The surprise is that they literally wanted to eat this boy, which did its job in being really scary. I'm an adult human in her 30s and it had great impact, especially since it was shot well. It was grisly without showing any blood or gore. It was all done with sound effects and implication, and the fact that Walt was watching himself getting eaten alive. Nope, that's next level horror for me. There are some things worse than death, and this is one of them. This is a truly dark moment in this series, and it was hard to grasp what age group it'd be appropriate for. The young characters make it more relatable to a younger crowd, but the story itself is suited for teenagers, which is who this anthology is meant for, it's just polarizing. It feels like a really messed up episode of Goosebumps. Though I would compare it more closely to an episode of Are You Afraid of the Dark called The Tale of the Dark Music, which also featured a monster consuming a human being, though it was definitely tamer than what you see in Alien Candy, and this conclusion was just gross, which I think is too immature for a teenage audience. Goosebumps had a lot of gross-out moments because kids tend to like it. It's a type of horror they can consume because there's always a corny element to it. Gross doesn't always equal frightening. So when the aliens get their comeuppance at the end of the episode, I didn't get any lingering feelings of fear or intensity. I just got a stomach ache, then promptly swore off chicken nuggets. I think an ending that would have fit better with this series and would be more appropriate horror in general is the bully getting his comeuppance. If you're a longtime horror fan, you're probably familiar with unsavory people, particularly abusers and harassers, getting what they deserve. Stephen King does this a lot in his writing, and R.L. Stein does it too. But in this story, two good characters are targeted, the bully ends up fine, and the aliens are wiped away completely. 
Usually there's a little more ambiguity about what happens to the main monster or villain. A lot of the time, it's implied that the horror is still lurking somewhere out there, ready to strike again. I think an ambiguous ending is way more effective than a more conclusive ending like this one. If I were to rework this script, I would have written Dwayne to be the next target. It would keep the fear of the aliens alive while giving the viewer the satisfaction of seeing a bad character suffer for his actions. You could even have him disappear mysteriously, followed by having the two good guys believe they did away with the aliens, ending with a small hint that they are still out there somewhere preying on more people. Ending with a gross out moment is a little cheap if you ask me, especially since I think the story itself is okay. Like I said, I was horrified at this scene. I even thought the alien heads looked pretty good, especially in the chase scene where the lighting could be played with to make them look even more monster-like, casting shadows in just the right places to trick your imagination, but I wanted that fear to be a little more consistent. It almost had a slapstick feel to it. I realized that the structure of this episode does heavily rely on the conclusion having the aliens being eaten. They wanted to feed on humans, but they ended up being the alien candy in the end. It's cohesive, I just don't think it's a very creative story. This isn't to say I don't think you should watch it, it really is bonkers and effective. I just have no idea where something like this fits within young adult horror. It's too messed up to be for a younger crowd, and it's a little too immature to be taken seriously by teenagers or an older crowd. Though I do give it props for succeeding in making me feel extremely uncomfortable, so I guess this episode gets the most squicks award. I do like seeing some boundaries being pushed when it comes to horror, but can we not cook alien goo into chicken nuggets? Thanks. Interestingly, there is another episode from this anthology that features human consumption called The Mascot, and it was also pretty disturbing, but the victims were still all in one piece. I just do not want to imagine watching someone biting off my toe. If there's an episode of The Haunting Hour you would love to see me cover, please leave a suggestion in the comments. In fact, the reason I covered this one is because someone made a very compelling case for it on Twitter, so I'm very interested in all of your burning hot children's horror takes. Until then, stay spooky. Hey everyone, thanks again for watching my video on The Haunting Hour. I have more to offer if you're interested, but first I want to thank my patrons for supporting me and this channel. Otherwise, who knows if I would have ever made a video about alien cannibalism. It's all thanks to them. If you're interested in supporting this channel, consider checking out my campaign, and if not, likes, shares, and feedback are free and always welcome. If you're interested in more commentary on The Haunting Hour anthology, then I have a suggestion on the left where I discuss an episode about turning children into pumpkins. Very intriguing indeed. On the right, I have an episode about even more oddities, the cult classic show Beyond Belief starring Jonathan Frakes. Thanks again, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.